Hello and welcome to you as you're drifting in. Welcome to everyone. We'll be getting started in just a bit. If you are on Whova and you haven't done the poll yet, you would like to check the poll, you can go ahead and do that. We'll be sharing the results of that later in the session. If you have questions, you can either put them in the, in the Zoom Q&A that's there or put them in the Whova Q&A. There are a couple of questions there already. See some familiar names and some names that are new to me. And I just want to let you know that I will not be looking at the chat during this. I will be looking at the Q&As because I only have four eyes. I can't look at everything at the same time. So unfortunately, because of the format we're using, there's not going to be a lot of interactivity available to you. You can't turn on your camera. I wish I could see you. You can't turn on your mic. The only opportunities for input will be through the Q&As, either through Whova, ask a question, or through the Zoom Q&A uh, panel. Uh, I will not I will, might have time to occasionally check the chat, but I won't be able to watch it at the same time. So if you have questions, try and put them in one of the question formats. All right. Just another minute to let people filter in and then we'll get started with the main content. Okay, there's a question in the Q&A. Does anyone know of a good book for parents who come out to their adult children? Hmm. Coming out to your adult children is an issue we're gonna be talking about. Off the top of my head, I don't know of any older LGBTQ folks. I take that back. I don't know of any books from LGBTQ folks, but there are a number of trans parents who have shared their experiences coming out to their children. But as far as gay, lesbian, bi, genderqueer, um, I don't know of any books. And this is a good time to say, if you have references for one another, feel free to put those in the chat. I won't be able to see them right away, but you can chat with each other there.
All right. Well, let's officially start. Welcome. My name is Lynn Malone. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm really excited to be able to share this space with you and this time with you. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend time on a screen with me and with other people who are curious about this issue. So this panel, this panel, panel of one, this, uh, this webinar is about coming out later in life. And later sort of depends on where you're standing in your own life. Some of us come out at 18 and feel like we're late because our friends all came out at 13, 14, 15. Some of us come out in college and feel like we're late. And some of us come out in our 50s and 60s and everybody agrees that's pretty late. Now, over time, those numbers are changing the average age, and we'll talk about that in a little while. A couple of things I'd like to say up front. One, I am only speaking from my experience. I am not an expert on this subject at all. There is an expert panel tomorrow. There is a whole panel by the folks at the Christian Closet on best practices on coming out in general. So I really encourage you, if you want professional opinions, to attend that. For me, this is just a chance to let other people know that they're not alone in coming out to share my story because I think it might resonate with some folks and to share some sort of helpful tips and tricks that I've learned in the years, almost 15 years since I've been out to myself. As I keep, as I, if I look over here, it means I'm looking into the Whova Q&A. If I look over here, it means I'm looking into the Zoom Q&A. Just so you know, it's not just random checking out the street noise. So, who am I and why am I doing this? I am a person who was in a mixed orientation marriage for 25 years. And about 10 years into that marriage, I finally figured out that I was gay. I was 34 years old and at the movies with a friend of mine from church. And this was 1996. And there were two movies in the theater at the time, both about angels and being good, good church girls. We were going to go see one of them. One of them was Michael with John Travolta. And the other was The Preacher's Wife with Whitney Houston and Denzel Washington as the angel. So my friend and I were trying to decide which movie to go to. And finally she looked at me and said, well, who do you wanna watch for the next two hours? John Travolta or Denzel? And without thinking about it, I said, Whitney. And she looked at me, said, what is that supposed to mean? It's like, that's kind of a no brainer question. Wouldn't everybody rather be looking at Whitney? Um, apparently not, especially not, you know, 30 something church lady moms. So she said, you might want to think about what that means. So I went home and thought about it, kind of looked around, figured out, oh, huh, now that you ask, yep, I'm gay. It had never occurred to me that I was a person who could be gay. Growing up in the 70s, the only gay icon I knew of was Elton John. And I was pretty sure I didn't have a lot in common with him. Fortunately, young people today have many more role models and many more visible represent examples of representation of all kinds of things. It also probably has something to do with the fact that I'm somewhere on the gray ace spectrum and who I wanted was never a really major issue. See, growing up for, for me, especially because of women, because of the role of women in the 60s and 70s, we were never told to wonder about who we wanted or our own desires. We were only told what not to do. And in a lot of conservative churches and in purity culture, this is actually still a thing. It's girls being told what not to do, what not what to want. And nobody ever mentioned the possibility of wanting a woman. So fast forward all that, 34 when I figured out I was gay, came out to my husband. He said, well, are you going to do anything about it? Like, 
am I going to go leave him or get in a relationship? And I'm like, nope. So he said, oh, okay. And that was about it. That was all the conversation we had for another 15 years, other than occasional jokes about who was hotter, Faith or Buffy. Um, so it wasn't until the end of my marriage, which ended for other reasons, that I came out publicly. And when I came out publicly, and this is the thing about coming out, it's never just a one, one and done thing. There's lots of stages. You can come out at church, you can come out at work, you can come out to your family, you can come out to your kids, you can come out to your parents, and all of those have their own complications. And we'll talk about some of those in a little bit. So it was when I was 50 and our marriage ended that I came out at church. And oddly enough, my the elder of my church that I first came out to had the exact same question as my husband 15 years before. Well, are you gonna do anything about it? I'm like, nope. He's like, okay. I was actually the leader of the children's ministry at the time. And you'd think that might be problematic for an evangelical church. But in our little church, they'd known me for a long time. And they just said, we know you, okay. That has not been the experience for many people in ministry who have come out, they're particularly conservative evangelical churches. But I was very fortunate in that respect. So that's my story. And I got involved in all kinds of rainbow activities, went through the whole rainbow everything phase that newbie coming out people do. Uh, and told everybody, told my son. And I told my son the year that my husband and I separated. It was also the year he turned 18. And after I moved out of the house, uh, we went on a road trip actually for his 18th birthday. And I told him, you know, one of the factors in that in my new life, it wasn't the reason for our divorce, but one of the factors in my new life is that I'm gonna be out as gay. And he, the first thing he said was, are you gonna get a girlfriend? I'm like, no. He said, good, because I don't think I could handle two parental girlfriends at the same time. His dad had already started dating, even though we weren't divorced, divorced yet. So I assured him I had no intention of doing that at that time. And he's been great with it ever since. In fact, uh, he was, he had college roommates who were gay. He had friends who were gay. We had family friends who were gay. It had never been an issue of being affirming in that sense. So I was never afraid of what he was going to say. Again, very privileged position I was in because I know a number of friends who came out to their adult children or to their teenage children or to their younger children who were, because the children were so devout and so conservative, who were either banned from seeing their children by their spouse or had a real rupture in their relationships. And that's a sad reality as well. So as I said, that's just my story. It's just the perspective I'm speaking from. Let's talk in more general terms. First, let's talk about terms. Coming out. What does it mean to come out? Now, a lot of younger people have started using, kind of pushing back against the term coming out at all, using welcoming in or becoming more open. And if you just watch the general session, becoming freer, becoming more liberated, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of other metaphors that are being used for growing into one's gay experience. Um, but for those of us who were in a closet of one kind or another, which is where coming out the metaphor comes from, if you were in the closet, if you felt like you had to hide something in your life, if you had to feel like there was something shut off from the world at large, then that's that coming out metaphor. For younger and younger people, that will become a less and less appropriate metaphor because outside the conservative Christian church, closets aren't really much of a thing anymore. Now, in some immigrant communities and some other kind of communities, cultural factors lead to more of that. But for most of the younger core folks I know, they were never in the closet to begin with, so they never had to come out. Mostly what they just had to do is let people in on what they were going through in their particular lives. So when we talk about the statistics for the age of coming out, that can mean different things to different people. But the survey that the surveys that I looked at that have been done over decades about coming out have showed an interesting trend. 
So according to the research, the age of coming out has been dropping. In the 1970s, it was early 20s, the average age of queer people coming out. In the 1990s, it was around 16. Since 2000, it's dropped to about 14. There are a lot of reasons for that. Now, that's in the general culture. At this point, I'd like to share, and I'm not exactly sure how to do this on Whova. I'd like to share the results of our poll. So about 40 people answered the poll. And let's see what the latest answers are. Poll. Okay, so the latest data, according to our, oh my goodness, 74 people have now answered this poll for our particular webinar. The highest category for the people attending this conference who answered this poll of the age of coming out is now 25 to 39. 25 among us, 14 in the general population. Then the next two categories, age 18 to 24 and 40 to 55 are kind of on the other side. Of the 75 people who answered this, only four came out before the age of 18. So the respondents to this very unscientific poll in this self-selected group are very different from what the culture would currently lead us to expect. If you hear something from above, I live with two young children who are home because their mom just came down with COVID. So if you hear some jumping and noise, pray for our family. The age of coming out in the church, particularly in the conservative or evangelical or the sort of types of churches that a lot of us come from, is far higher than in the general population. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of the reasons for that, but let me just mention a few. First is fear of family rejection. In most of our culture, in most of American culture right now, now this is not true globally, and for those of you who are watching internationally, I'm not erasing you, I see you, um, but I can only speak from the experience that, that I'm familiar with. In American church culture, Fear of family rejection is a huge reason to delay coming out. It's the strongest walls of the closet. That is tragic. And we need, as a group of Christians, to be working on that. Fear of family rejection. I mean, it's still a tragic fact that for all other demographics, Church attendance reduces risk of suicide, but for queer kids, it raises it. So fear of family rejection. The second thing is purity culture. Uh, kind of like me back in the 60s and 70s, if you're always told stay away from boys, stay away from boys, stay away from boys, it might not occur to you to think about the fact that who you really ought to be being told to be stay away from might be girls or at least that that would be an option, if not a problem. And the third reason is that in many churches, many conservative churches, there's this whole package of political conservative values that go along with religious conservative values. And that can complicate locating oneself in the sort of so socio-political landscape the idea that you could be part of queer culture or part of the LGBTQ community might mean so many things besides just who you're attracted to or who you want to love, that it's hard to recognize yourself is, as someone who needs to come out as that. So there are lots of reasons for church folks to come out later than people in the general culture. 
So let me take a moment and look at the questions and answers because I think there's some questions that have come up directly related to these things. The question is how, at what age did you come out? I told you that for me, and then you can be chatting amongst yourselves about that. And how do you define coming out? Now coming out can be a whole process of recognizing for yourself what's going on with yourself. It can happen when you get in a relationship. Many, many lesbians my age figured out they were gay because they actually fell in love and then realized, wait a minute, what is going on here? Rather than sort of in the abstract before. So coming out can be noticing your own feelings and telling them to yourself. It could be noticing your own feelings, not necessarily actions, and telling them to others. It could be announcing a relationship you're in. It could be any of those things. So one of the questions was, I'm hoping you'll address the issue that because of the changing awareness and demographic, those of us who come out later and older feel like our needs are invisible. There seems to be no support for us. Right, because if everybody assumes that if you're gay, you're gonna be out by 21, what does that mean for folks who come out later? Particularly those who have been in mixed orientation marriages or straight seeming relationships. Fortunately, at QCF, there are age group, <laughs> predetermined age groups, like I'm in tapestry and some people, or some people might be in cinnamon waffles, or if you're not familiar with this, those age group groupings, check the community board and see where you might fall. Um, if somebody who's really familiar with those wants to put them in the chat, that might be helpful for folks. Um, also, there's a lot about coming out to your parents, but as we noted earlier, there's not a lot about coming out to your kids at various ages. Now, the mixed orientation marriage subgroups and workshops will address that more directly. And so if you need resources, those are great places to go. Uh, somebody says, I prefer the term called out rather than coming out because God pulled me out. It wasn't my choice. Yep, that sounds familiar. I figured out I was gay about six months after I got baptized. And I totally believe it was the work of the Holy Spirit. So I wouldn't say that, you know, getting baptized made me gay, but I would say that the work of the Holy Spirit in my life has led me to recognize aspects of myself I would not have otherwise. Now, coming out as a sacrifice. One of the disadvantages of coming out much later in life is that we have more life to come out of. There are more people who have a stake in our identity. Spouses, children, we're aunts and uncles of folks, we're, we could be grandparents, we have careers. I don't know how many older guys I've talked to who were in ministry and who were either kicked out of their ministry or kicked out of their churches for coming out after they'd spent a lifetime dedicated to church work. There is a real cost for having invested your whole life in the church and figuring out that you're no longer gonna be welcome there. So this question is, I was painfully closeted for 40 years. Coming out was a huge sacrifice, but also liberation. But when I heard Minnie's talk this morning, it felt like younger generation and current people are using queer as language not to define sexuality and gender, but as a resistance to social traditional norms. Using that feels dismissive. Queer is being claimed by queer theorists who may actually be cishet progressives. So the, who owns the word coming out? Who owns the word queer is something that's worth debating. Um, or if not debating, at least dialoguing with folks who might feel different. The word queer itself is problematic for a lot of older folks because it was used so violently against them. I say them because I didn't know I was queer when I was a kid. So playing smear the queer football was not really an issue for me. 
but I know young guys for, you know, older guys who, when they were younger, every time they had to play that game. And this was something we played in PE at school, smear the queer, because it was tackle football. You had to get the person with the ball. That kind of casual homophobia, you know, was part of culture universally in previous decades that I hope is being corrected now, although occasionally I still hear it. So all that is to say, not everyone is comfortable with the word queer period. And the use of queer in other ways than for gender and sexuality can be problematic for some folks. And that's totally understandable. Okay, let me just check these cute questions again. All right. Uh, one person asked early on if later in what later in life means. And as we talked a little bit about, you know, if you can come out at 18 and feel like you're coming out later in life, depending on your social group, or you can come out at in college and feel late. Anytime that happens, anytime you come out, there will be ramifications. And I think one of the more important things that can make your coming out or calling in or being called out more healthy and comfortable for you is to have a support group around you, whether it's people of your own age or if you're younger, people who are older who have gone through this process ahead of you. Role models and representation are really vital. And thanks to technology, we can have access to role models uh, and mentors that we didn't before. In my process of coming out as being on the ACE spectrum, gray ACE, whatever, I learned everything I knew about all of that language from people much younger than I, because we just didn't have that language when I was coming up. Um, I also deal with some mental health challenges, and I've learned a lot about some of those challenges from young YouTubers. So for those of us who are older, we can look to younger folks. For those of us who are younger, we can look to older folks for help in the experience of coming out or processing our own sexuality and gender issues. This is a very specific question. What are viable ways of meeting other gay men over 40 when COVID seems to have shut down both social groups? Okay, I'm not the best person to answer this question for sure, because I'm not looking for a man over 40. Although I do live with two. I live in an intentional community of uh, uh, Christians who live together and worship together. And we are a, what's considered a third way community, which means we have people in our community who are both side A and side B. And if you're not familiar with that terminology, uh, side A is fully affirming of same sex relationships, sex, marriage, and side B beliefs uh, that, you know, gay folks uh, steward their sexuality best either in celibacy or in mixed gender marriages. Anyway, we have both in our community and uh, both one of them is side A and one of them is side B. All that is to say one of the best places to look for friends of any gender and any age is at church. Now, even with COVID, churches are still meeting in one way or another. Do it safely, however you do it. But church is still one of the best places to look um, to make solid relationships with other queer Christians. Now, the older you get, the smaller the pool gets, just demographically. And in our older years, say 50, 60, 70 and up, part of what we're dealing with just as human development goes is looking back at our relationships and building our relationships. There's still room for new relationships, but stewarding the relationships we have uh, is equally important. There are a number of ways to connect socially, uh, virtually or safely during COVID. And some people find it through church, some people find it through hobbies, some people find it through uh, volunteer work. It just depends on your situation. Now, the older we get, perhaps the less comfortable some of the traditional ways of meeting other queer folks are. For example, I don't go to bars anymore, really. Um, 
and a lot of folks my age and older uh, really feel uncomfortable on a, in a lot of scenes that are that are either too loud <laughs> or are too late at night or require driving in the dark. So it does uh, close down our options in some ways. But if you're creative, you can find other ways. Okay, let's look at more of these. All right, let's look at some, since I don't see any new questions right now, uh, let's look at some advantages of coming out later. We talked about some of the disadvantages, but some of the advantages are coming out later. Now, again, at this point, I'm gonna talk about coming out, let's say after you're no longer on your parents' insurance. So, you know, after 25 or so. Coming out after you're no longer on your parents' insurance has a lot of advantages. One, you can, you are much less likely to be outed inadvertently and you can take your time. Two, you are usually more financially and socially independent. And the fear of family rejection is no longer a fear for your survival. Because if you get tossed out at 14 or 15, that's a much more serious threat than not being welcome to come home for Christmas when you're 25 or 26. The latter is very painful, but it's not gonna kill you unless you're already struggling with severe depression and it triggers an incident. In that case, work with your mental health professionals and not to, not to minimize that coming out and having your family reject you is one of the most painful things at any age, whether it's your parents or your grandparents or your brothers and sisters, your nieces and nephews, your own kids or grandkids. That kind of family rejection can be devastating. So one of the advantages of coming out later is that you're usually more able to control the process and you're less dependent on those you're coming out to often. A second advantage of coming out later is that you know yourself better in other ways. You might know, you might have had some other relationships. You might have realized what you, you know, what you need to work on for your own personal growth before getting in a relationship or while in a relationship. So in some ways you can come out as a healthier, more whole person, the older you come out. Another advantage is that if you wait long enough, there are people you don't have to come out to. Like I never had to come out to my grandparents who were very Catholic and would, be, would have been very, very upset. Um, my dad was also not around by the time I came out. And when I came out to my mom, I was 50 and was part, it was part of telling, I was telling her both that I was getting a divorce and that I was going to my first uh, gay Christian conference, which was actually the West Coast Connection, the first West Coast Connection here in California, um, because it was happening in the town next door to my hometown. So I was going home to California from living in Maryland. And I had to make an excuse to my mom about why I wasn't staying with her that well, because I'm staying in the hotel at the conference. So what kind of a conference? And uh, she said, Oh, I said, it's a gay Christian conference. And she said, oh, it's nice of you to support them. And I said, no, mom, I'm gay. And she looked at me for a second and just said, since when? Which is kind of a valid question. It wasn't really hostile. She was kind of puzzled. Since when? Since 25 years of marriage and all the boyfriends I had in high school and everything else in my life had led her to believe I was straight. Most of it had led me to believe I was straight. So after that, since when, she was being very conservative Catholic herself. She was sort of puzzled and not particularly approving, but I was not dependent on her well, uh, for my welfare or my well-being. And I went to my conference and had a great time and went back to Maryland and we never really discussed it again. And uh, that was 15 years ago. So there are advantages to coming out later in life as well. 
Okay, question here. I came out as a 46 year old minister a week before COVID lockdown in 2020. I came out late because it took me that long to decide it wasn't wrong for me to be gay. Hmm. My church has been good for the most part, but I have no idea how to meet other gay or LGBTQ plus folks. And the idea of learning how to date is terrifying. I can't imagine going to a gay bar. I've never been a bar person and church has always been my social group. <laughs> this isn't a question yet, but except what do I do now that I've come out? It's been two years and I feel freer and more honest, but I have no LGBTQ plus queer group. Great question. Now what, you know? Well, are you gonna do anything about it? So I wanna parallel it to sort of what would have happened if say you were widowed. I don't want to minimize the experience of anybody's grief, but if you had become say a widower at 45 uh, or 46, how would your life have changed? Would you have had to relearn dating? Would you have, where would you have found new people to meet? Church, volunteer groups, hobbies. Now, depending on your own faith background, exploring affirming churches may or may not be an option for you, but they're the best place to find other queer Christians. Affirming churches, that's what kind of what they're for. And it doesn't have to be MCC, a completely queer denomination. The first gay Christians I knew were all Episcopalians. And this was back in the seventies and eighties before it was sort of officially okay. There are many places to find queer Christians online and in, <laughs> in many geographic areas, not everywhere, not, there are lots of folks I know that live in the sparsely populated Midwest or the deep South who wouldn't be able to find an affirming church within driving distance. But if you can, that is obviously an option. Another might be your local LGBTQ center, community center, um, volunteer options. Those are kind of places, but I feel you with having to learn how to date, especially if all your dating behavior was focused when you were younger toward a certain gender, and now it's going to be focused toward the other gender, that can be a really intimidating shift. Okay, another mention, more of a, a helpful comment rather than a question. If it's appropriate, you might mention that coaching can be a resource, along with therapy to, come more, to support the coming out process. There are a couple coaches and therapists in the exhibitor area. So, Check out, if you feel like you could use literally coaching on how to do this about something like how to start dating or how to meet people, life coaches, professional coaches are a thing and, or are people. And there are people who are available to you online at Whova in our exhibitor area for this conference. So thanks John for that helpful tip. Therapy is for everyone and particularly for everyone who has to have a major life change, no matter what your age, it can be really helpful to have a therapist because the best thing about a therapist for me is that they are 100% on your side. If you need somebody to just complain to and say, these people are not treating me right, they will be in your corner. And good therapists will not push you in any particular direction. They will listen to what you're saying you need. So there's my plug for therapy as well for coach as well as for coaching. Now, when I was leaving my marriage and coming out publicly, I was fortunate to be living in Washington D.C. at the time, and there's a, a clinic there called Whitmer Walker Clinic that serves the LGBTQ community, and they have coming out groups, support groups. Um, in particular, I was one in one that was coming out for women. And so we met as a group for like six weeks and we talked about our various challenges in coming out. If you can find a coming out support group these days, it might be online. Uh, that could be a definite plus, although uh, you'll find people in all different situations and all different uh, ideas of what coming out should be. I had a young friend tell me that he visited an affirming church and right after, he, as he was coming out, 
and the the it was pastored by a, a lesbian couple and they found out he was newly out and they looked at him and just said with great delight oh you're about to go through your slut phase <laughs> which kind of took him aback but there is a process of coming out especially if you're interested in looking at new relationships that uh, is sometimes termed as second adolescence or uh, you know the new the new dating game and that looks very different for different people depending on your own sexuality your sexual ethics and things like that but don't be surprised if some people are more encouraging uh, of exploration than you might be ready for while others are the opposite. So both of those things can be happening. And to find a sort of impartial coach or therapist who can really just sit with you and say, without any agenda on their part, sit with you and say, what are you comfortable with now? What are the roadblocks in your way? And how do you feel like you, you could move forward? Those are all really helpful things. Checking for more questions. Couples. And got okay. Okay, one is, what is your dating advice for middle age and older queer folks? I'm the last person to ask about that because I have literally not dated since 1980. So, cause that's when I met the guy who would become my husband. We met in college when I was 18 and I pretty much only dated him in college. Occasionally other people, well, we would break up every once in a while. Uh, people would try to fix me up with other guys. Never really hit it off. And now I know why. But uh, yeah, I got married when I was 25, stayed married till I was 50 and have not dated since. So if you have good dating advice, drop it in the chat. And there are also some other workshops later in the weekend that will be helpful for that. Yeah, so I just got to confess right there, not the expert on that subject. SAGE, yes. Um, SAGE is an organization for older gay and lesbian folks and bisexual folks. Uh, depending on where you are, there might be a local SAGE chapter, but there's also an online access to SAGE, which is uh, a good thing. They have a, a minimum age, kind of a minimum age requirement. I'm not sure I'm quite there. I just turned 60 this year. So uh, I haven't been involved with that myself, but it's something I've always been aspiring to. Okay. There's a comment and question from someone who said, I came out as transgender at 61, 40 years into my marriage. My story sounds similar to yours is that I wouldn't have identified myself as trans until a revelatory moment in October, 2016. We're still married, congratulations, and trying to remain so. This means that I completely sequester my trans expression from my wife with her full knowledge, I see. So you keep that part of your life separate from your life with your wife, your life with your wife. We've agreed to daily expression in the early mornings before she awakes, and full expression for limited times of travel, like conferences. Huh. Have you heard of any groups for mixed gender identity couples trying to find a way forward? No group specifically. I have a couple of friends who are in similar positions. They are trying to maintain their marriage while figuring out, uh, in both cases, um, how the person previously identified as the husband would explore their gender identity. And yours sounds like a very, um, in some ways a very sweet arrangement um, that your wife is trying to support you as best she knows while still really limiting you on your expression 
and I wish I wish you the best with that. So no, I don't know any groups for that, but in the mixed orientation marriage um, workshops in the whole universe in the social groups there, I have seen other folks whose mix is not orientation, but an issue of identity. So that sort of broader umbrella, uh, broader umbrella does welcome folks who are dealing with uh, trans identity, trans experience under that under that larger rubric. I hope that here, you know, that's a possibility on the Whova platform. There's lots of ways to connect with people, and if you're ever going to find folks, this might be a chance to do that. So I encourage you to anybody who's looking for anybody of a specific experience. Put yourself out there on Whova. It's just us. So go ahead and try that. And I see there might be things going on in the chat that might be helpful as well. Again, I'm sorry, I can't see that right now. Okay, one more run through the questions. Okay. Now, as far as references in general, there have been a couple of questions about books and references. One of the best books I've read recently about LGBTQ folks in the church and how to make your churches more comfortable uh, or less horrible um, at, that does support folks who are coming out and in transition is something called Heavy Burdens by the author Bridget Eileen Rivera. And she talks about lots of different burdens that folks that the church have, has put on queer folks um, and sort of some hopeful ways out of those. So that's been helpful for me recently. Bio autobiographies, um, people sharing their stories. There have been some, Paula Stone Williams has had some very useful talks on her transition and sharing with her kids. Um, and she occasionally speaks with her son as well. But frankly, there's a certain level of ageism within the LGBTQ community. It's like as if being gay was only for young people. I think that's somewhat less true in the trans community, partly because there have been so many visible people who have transitioned as older. So finding references that are specifically age appropriate for those of us say over 50 or over 55 is challenging. If you know any, stick them in the comments. One of the reasons I wanted to do this workshop in the first place is because at my previous Q conferences, other than the specific age group meetups, which were usually just for a meal, there wasn't, there hasn't been a lot on aging well, cure uh, as queer. And part coming out late is part of the larger aging well spectrum. Looks like there are a couple more questions jumping in into the chat. Uh, okay. All right. A couple more things I wanted to make sure that I mentioned before we closed. And one is that there can sometimes be a pressure to come out that needs to be resisted. There can also be a judgment in the LGBTQ community against people who are not yet out. And I just wanna support everyone who is not yet out or is only out to certain people or is only out in certain areas of their life to tell you that that's fine. You are under no obligation to share any of yourself with anybody that you would not want to. It is a privilege for people to know you. It is not your obligation to let them know what's going on with you. 
I have a few older friends who haven't come out yet, partly because they figured out who they were later in life and are afraid of being thought of as having deceived their friends all this time, are afraid of being judged for you know, being fake or are afraid of their friends re-examining all of their relationships, all of their previous time. <laughs> I remember when I first came out to one of my friends uh, who I'd been friends with for 15 years and did not know this about me. Uh, she just kind of looked at me and she said, were you ever attracted to me? As if she's like re-questioning our whole friendship. And that is a thing that sometimes can happen, but that does not mean you were being deceptive. And it doesn't mean that I was being deceptive. It doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. Take your time coming out and make sure that you feel safe. You don't owe anybody your story. You don't owe anybody your truth, especially if you know or strongly suspect that they will not be a safe person. Okay. Good support groups for straight spouses in mixed orientation marriages. I know that there are sessions on that later. Um, I don't know any. When I was in a mixed orientation marriage, I wasn't out yet. Uh, so I was out to my husband. I was out to two close friends. Um, and I mostly came out to them, partly because of this deception issue that I was talking about. These were the two friends that I would always share rooms with at church conferences and things like that. And the more I was aware of my own sexuality, the more I realized that if they later found out I was gay, that might make them uncomfortable. So fortunately on my, in my part, uh, that neither of them were people I was particularly attracted to. If I had been in love with one of them, that would have been much more complicated, but uh, they were two of the first people I came out to. So other than support and my husband, after I told him that I was gay, he never told anybody. Um, I was, I came out to his best friend uh, much later and realized that he'd never told him. Uh, so, so I don't know much about supporting straight spouses or queer spouses in mixed orientation marriages, but there are people here who do. So I do encourage you. I'm sorry that this has been a little bit of a, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm here anyway but at least I hope to save some space for folks who can do this, who need some encouragement and who needs you know, ref references and getting to meet one another. I do encourage you to exchange information in the chat. If you know, if other people's questions, if you resonate with other people's questions, say, hey, I'm in that situation or, oh, I used to be in that situation. Here's how I dealt with it. So chat is your friend. What advice can you give in terms of coping with regret and grief over oh, the years you've wasted in the closet? Oh boy, this is what I feel. Yeah. Well, here are a couple of things that have helped me. For example, the community I live in now, I could have joined before I got married. Uh, but I chose to get married instead. And I have a lot of regret about not having been there through those years, not having invested in these relationships rather than that relationship. On the other hand, I also know that I'm a different person than I was when I was 25. And I'm much more suited to the life I have now. I'm a lot more informed about both myself and about people in general. So I think that all of our experiences teach us either resilience or what to avoid. And in that sense, no time is ever a waste. There might be specific op opportunities that we've missed, but we were given other opportunities and other gifts because God was never not there. God was never not in our struggles with us. And God brings good things out of even the worst of things. So one of the things that helps me fight regret is to look for 
what gifts I was given in those years that I might not have had otherwise. This is not to justify anybody's abusive situation. It is not to justify to any injustice, but just a reminder that God brings good things, beauty out of ashes, and we can't always see it, but sometimes when we look, we do get a glimpse of it. The other thing that I think helps me with dealing with regret, um, <laughs> so one thing about, I have a friend that I expressed a long time ago, one of the first people I came out to in my second round of coming out, you know, my public coming out, who has a lot of kids. And she said, if you'd never gotten married, you wouldn't have your kid. And I had to pause and think, well, maybe, maybe he would have come into the universe another way. Maybe not. But I do have to say that my kid is one of the great joys of my life. And if I had not gone through that relationship, I would not have him. Um, there are other things that other friends of mine who were not other things, not people. Um, there are people who took career paths that they never would have if they had been out and are really glad for that. There are things that, that have molded and shaped us, even in the closet, that can be used as gifts and can be turned to gifts. Um, and the other thing that helps with the grit is just allowing myself to be sad sometimes. It's okay to be sad about missed opportunities. It's okay to be sad about that. Feel those feelings, as my therapist would tell me, and know that they're part of human experience. As a friend of mine always says, you can't have everything. Where would you put it? We can't have every experience in life. We only have our own one life. And that's all I got to say about that. I'm not sure how helpful that was. All right, it is time to wrap up. Let me just say, if you wanna continue this conversation, you can find me on Whova or find me on Facebook. Uh, and you can find one another if you've been chatting in the chat or find one another if you see their participant names, uh, you can find them in Whova as well. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of conference and thank you for sharing this time with us. I'm gonna close in prayer. God, creator God, who makes no mistakes and brings beauty out of all of our mistakes in some way, in some fashion, even if we don't see it today. Thank you for all the time you've given us and all the eternity you've given us. Be with us as we travel through this conference. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>